Are you a risk management professional who wants to improve their opportunity, who wants to reach more hiring managers and recruiters because you can demonstrate the skills that you have associated with risk management? Well, you're in the right place. I'm Justin Hitt from Inside Strategic Relations, and I just finished up a book called Establishing Instant Credibility. And what I'm going to do in this presentation is I'm going to walk you through the key elements necessary to position yourself as a risk management professional. So this could be somebody that's got a compliance manager, uh, a operational risk consultant, a risk analyst, a compliance officer, those types of positions. We're going to talk a little bit about personality. We're going to talk a little bit about the skill set, and then we'll go into the specific approach to leverage your skill set in this opportunity. Now, positions in the risk management world do pay good money, but they do require experience and a, and a background in finances, technology, or uh, some other area that has got regulations. So if you're in the gaming industry, for example, you need to understand the money laundering and the bank secrecy and the other factors associated with the gaming industry, which could include human trafficking and other factors. If you're in the financial services industry, you still might have the same bank secrecy, money laundering, uh, those types of activities, but you may be looking at other types of activities like terrorist funding. There's going to be overlap in industries. Uh, so we're talking generically uh, here because the core skills matter. There are good risk management skills. Now, I mentioned personality a little bit. Um, there is a perception that risk management professionals have no sense of humor and uh, they're more like accountants than they are you know, glad handing and being friends. And that's because it's very analytical work. When you are doing a risk management assessment or like a, a risk self-assessment, you have to objectively look at an environment, take in a lot of information, and then digest that information into the key things that you're looking for. Now, what do we use to digest that information? So we're going to have strong analytical and problem solving skills. So if your personality is very loosey-goosey and you, you've read the regulation and you kind of understand it and you're thinking about implementing it, that's not a good because an auditor comes along, they're going to expect things to be done exactly as they're written down. So when we write controls or we, we uh, provide advice on business processes, we need it to be written down exactly how it's being done, not how the future state might be, not how the past state might be, but you need to have the analytical skills to map out that process to see if it's feasible. And then with the, insert the inserting of the controls, so controls are going to be uh, detecting or preventing risk. You've got to be able to see in your head that three-legged triangle, which is the process, risk, and control, PRC, and then how they interact with each other in the context of the laws, rules, and regulations that are there. So it is very cognitive type of role. You don't have to have a super genius uh, IQ for it, but you have to be consistent. You have to be analytical, meaning that if it's written down a certain way, it's tested a certain way. You don't read into the content. You have to uh, get opinions and document those opinions. As far as problem solving is concerned, when you do find a gap, you'll start building out what's called an issue. And that issue is going to have a problem statement a, a root cause and then some kind of corrective action. So you have to be able to solve the problem of a potentially non-compliant or a, a insufficient uh, control. And then you are going to get into the problem solving. Next, you need the ability to collect and analyze data. So how do you know that a control is ineffective? or that there's an issue that needs to be resolved. Well, you're gonna be able to look at the data sets itself. It could mean, and I've done this many times, reading every page of a consent order or sitting through eight hours of FTC um, discussions about, so there was a big program about model risk and it was eight hours of program and it was every taking notes about every little detail when it comes to model risk because we know in the machine learning and the artificial intelligence world that we're not completely sure why it's coming up with answers. So you can feed a model information and it can come out the other end and you know what the model's supposed to be doing, but because of tensors and other things, it is entirely possible that what comes out the other end is unexpected. Remember, artificial intelligence, and I talked about this in another article, will give you an answer. It's not necessarily the right answer. So being able to collect data 
analyze that data, be able to apply it to an analytic mindset, and the problem-solving skills can help you say whether or not there is inherent risk associated with the model itself. So this is especially important in the financial services world where you might have a credit model, for example. Uh, I'll give you an example of one model that doesn't always work the way it's supposed to, and it's the credit model associated with credit cards or non-secure debt. So you can feed in a lot of information, you're pulling in data from uh, maybe a Experian or some other reporting services, and you see a bad mark, and that bad mark looks at maybe low activity in the account, or it's looking at high activity in the account, it doesn't really matter, but it may make a decision that on paper doesn't make sense, which could be extending credit, it could be cutting back someone's credit line. Now, in the time I wrote a big article about this, that when it cuts back, the credit limit, what it actually creates is a cascading risk where the individual who has a credit card, maybe they've been late on one credit card, could be a medical incident, it could be related to a short-term disability, it could be related to some kind of protected activity. And when that one credit card goes down, if a bank who's receiving regular payments decides it's going to drop the credit line, for example, they could uh, do what's called rate farming and drop that credit line just above the actual balance, causing an overdraft, and then it starts escalating fees or changing the interest rate. Now, the change in interest rate lowers the risk for the bank, but it could be construed by a third party, if this happens to enough people, as an adversarial or a purposeful event to farm, uh, to farm fees. So when you're looking at a model like that, you want to think, okay, we're using external data and we're using internal data. And are we using both sets of data in parallel to come up with maybe a uh, two scores? And then you average those scores out in order to make a decision rather than overweighting one score or another. Um, and then also our historic data. So again, this can you collect the data to model out the potential risk, which could be a fair credit and reporting issue associated with dropping somebody's credit score because once the um, the available balances start going down because of an automated or triggered uh, reduction in credit, their credit score is going to drop, which is going to give you another signal that their credit score is dropping and cause you to take another adverse action. And that's what's, that's what's called a cascading effect. And actually, if you're interested in these models, I'd be more than happy to cover these models in another program. Let's move on to the next risk management skill. You need to have the ability to identify and assess risks. So I gave you one example there with an, uh, a machine-based uh, credit rating rather than a human looking at the full information about the individual. Uh, there are other factors where you might have a business proposing an approach, and then you have to kind of direct that business into understanding the full concept of what's happening so that your mortgage department doesn't do something that impacts the credit department or the credit department doesn't do something that impacts the mortgage. Imagine the credit triggering a reduction in credit line. Now the person overdrafts. Now the person has additional fees and higher percentage rates. And then the mortgage side is saying, oh my gosh, something's going on in the credit side. I better start uh, call this guy's loan. And um, a long time ago, when I had a computer consultancy business, I actually had a client that didn't pay their bills on time. And knowing how these things work, the I think it, they owed me $150,000 or something like that. I was able to go to Dun & Bradstreet and cause all of their mortgages to get called in on. Now, that is something that you don't want to trigger without a full evaluation of the situation because I actually had a court order that the people had to pay me. And when they refused to pay the court order, uh, the lawyer suggested that we go ahead and uh, put pressure on them to to give up the money. Now, they eventually we got into district court. They gave up some money. Long story short, though, if you understand how these models work, you can prevent them from working in an adversarial way. So, again, as an individual who is owed money, I had the choice of selling off the debt. I had the choice of pressuring the individual to pay the debt. I had the legal choice of going after them in court. Um, if you had that as an automated control in your environment, so the control would be protecting against the risk of doing that in a way that looked like uh, extortion or, to be honest, my business partner at the time wanted to get baseball bats and just go to their house and get the money. That would have been bad. So what in our, our risk model, what in our business process would prevent the 
uh, the dynamic range of possible activities, which would also fit within the laws, rules, and regulations. So I'm giving you a little sarcastic and wide band of of topic here, um, because you could go as far as show up like the mafia, or you can go and not collect at all. We had to pick something in the middle, which was within our legal rights under contract, under judgment and such. Now imagine you scale that up to a bank or you scale that up to a, an auto dealership, uh, or a, uh, a car loan company. You need to make sure that that doesn't get triggered where you're always out on the extremes. So if, if someone misses one payment, and you immediately repossess their vehicle. And the reason I talk about this is because Ford and some other companies were talking about remote turning off people's vehicles or not allowing the vehicle to start up if they're behind on payments. Well, if that's not modeled correctly and the data is not there to support why it's done a certain way and there's a, an electrical malfunction or a database error that causes a bunch of people's cards, cars to get turned off, then you have a liability associated with that. And so we, we want to make sure that we can identify potential risks, hypothetically, determine whether or not the probability of that activity exists, and then develop controls appropriately to prevent it from happening. And I've had, got a lot of experience looking at things, and we'll sit around the table, and half the ideas we come up with will probably never happen. But in a brainstorming session like that, when you have a a room full of operational risk consultants, uh, compliance risk managers, uh, you know, risk analysts, we can come up with two or three ideas that are highly probable and we can then control for them. So again, if you're an individual small business collecting money from clients who didn't pay on time, it's different than if you've got 50,000 transactions like that. Uh, the 50,000 transactions will be more modeled, more deliberate, and more uh, conservative in the sense of how they approach that so that you don't create either a cascading effect, you don't create uh, what's called dumping, where suddenly the, the individual is just swamped with automated messages and it looks like harassment. Uh, you want to make sure that your auto dialers are dialing within certain time frames and that if somebody's opted out of auto dialers and they're supposed to get mail only, that all that stuff works the way it's supposed to. Uh, the next th skill set for a risk management professional is the ability to develop and implement risk mitigation strategy. When we're sitting around brainstorming, we can come up with way more ideas than we can actually implement. So usually what you do is use some kind of risk model or some kind of scoring to, to narrow down the uh, within the context of the process and the context of the accepted risk by the business unit uh, to come up with the appropriate controls. And so this is moving us towards the implementation and you're going to come up with three or four expected controls. So maybe compliance has come to you and say, here's our major risk controls and you need to have controls around these areas and here's what we're expecting. And so those get implemented. Maybe you've developed your uh, risk oversight group and you've developed the expected controls, you need to be able to produce those and then work with the business. And this is the next skill, the strong communications and interpersonal uh, skills. You need to be able to work with the business to get the work done. Now, I mentioned earlier personality. I have a very dry and blunt, straightforward personality and resting bitch face. You know, if I just stop talking, I look like I'm mean, but I'm really not mean because I rely on the strong personal communication skills, the strong uh, listening skills. I put a lot of effort, including the podcasts that I develop, the presentations that I do for, for work groups and, uh, and internally, and also the, this, the activities I do within the industry. Strong communication skills are required. So I've done presentations to large groups, 170 people or so, and even small groups on the essentials of of developing a control. Why a well-developed control, an effective control, is actually a better preventative measure than doing better work at issue management. Uh, controls done well don't create issues. And ultimately, uh, the issue process is important, but we should be doing that and concentrating those resources on the most high risk, most dangerous issues. So again, being able to communicate, that's very important. Now I have value in what I do is that I can communicate across many executive levels. And this doesn't always work out for me, but it does work for the business. Very often I'm seen as a, a credible expert within the risk management world. 
and I will have senior level executives reach out to me in confidence and ask me to do certain things for them or take care of, uh, you know, work with somebody on their team. So maybe there's a, a, a business unit that's having problems getting their during the RCSA, which is the risk and control self-assessment. Maybe they're having trouble getting their controls across the finish line and the executive person doesn't want to just call out their middle manager. So what they suggest to me and, and other compliance people, it's not like they're coming to me only, is that we go over and just take a look at what they got, maybe do a control validation, maybe uh, just read their materials and just kind of give them a little help along. I will spend hours on the phone with a control officer or director or some vice president uh, making sure that their business unit understands what's expected from them when it comes to controls. So that means I've got to go work with the compliance team, the legal team, and the teams that develop the, the policies. I might even be part of the groups that review the policy, uh, but ultimately I need to sit down with a business and understand the, the context of it. Because there are times where I've been very blunt and very forward with the business unit because that's what they asked for. They said, look, don't don't hold back. Tell us exactly what audit would tell us. And they weren't happy with what I had to say. However, after an hour of working back and forth, they knew exactly what they needed to do in order to get the work done. And what was interesting about that particular situation is that somebody in the group saw it and they thought it was adversarial and dangerous to be talking like that. And that ultimately I was mean to them. Now, granted, I got a personal note from the, the executive that was involved in that conversation who's just a fly on the wall. Um, I got a personal note from the program manager that was in charge of all of the, the group that we were talking to, and it was some low-level person that should have been doing a better job. Now, again, the people that I worked with that I knew were in that meeting, uh, were um, they were better off for the conversation because they – uh, now, I assess that better. They're – them telling me they're better off, but it was a honest and clear conversation that perhaps I could have been a little more gentle with. Um, but again, uh, I don't want to spend four hours on the phone with somebody or, or we ended up uh, bringing up, you know, slides and examples of controls and stuff like that and saying things like this control is garbage. Let's talk about why it's garbage is meant to retain the attention because some people didn't didn't want to be on the call and their senior level leadership told them they had to be on the call. And so, again, I could be better at communications. And I, that's some one of the things that I'm working on. But strong communication skills, strong interpersonal uh, skills are required. It is perfectly fine with me when a and this has happened all through my career, when a senior level executive, somebody who's two down from the top, says, Justin, I need you to take care of something for me. Or they, it's not always just me on the phone, by the way. It might be me and another compliance officer, or it could be a risk officer. And they'll say, hey, guys, we need you to take care of this for us. And it's very important because I don't think the business is getting it and we can't afford another audit failure. So get in there and help them out. And so I, I do. That's what I do. But sometimes the interpersonal side could be better because the conversation you can have one-on-one, -on -one, if a, a third-party observer overhears it or the um, your middle manager <laughs> hears it, sometimes the folks can get a little upset. So that's something I'm working on and something you can work on as too. But again, when the business unit passes the audit, when the business unit has no uh, outstanding issues, all their critical issues are taken care of, all their controls are done on time and across the finish line, legal's happy and compliance is happy, uh, and the senior level executive is happy, I don't really care what the middle manager has to say. I keep my managers informed, but ultimately it is passing regulatory laws, rules, and regulations. And if we don't pass those, it is more of a problem than a manager being temporarily upset because some they find out that their manager's manager had asked me to do them a favor. They find out because I tell them. But anyway... Let's go on the next part. The last part here is the ability to work independent and as part of a team. So I have really strong skills in working independent. I'm a self-starter. I, I will get my teeth into something and stay with it till it's done. But there are also times where we have to sit down and delegate out the work. So if you want to be a great compliance officer, you want to be a great risk analyst, you want to be an operational risk consultant, and I've got more than 10 years of experience doing these things, um, you really have to be able to, to know when it's appropriate to work independently and know when it's important to bring in people. Now, let me give you a little tip on this. I always bring in people above me 
when it's work that's require is going to require a third party to do something. So I got a business unit and we're talking about privacy risk and I'm working with the senior level people in that team on our, on our kickoff meeting. And I let them tell me who the subject matter experts are to work with. Now, if I get to the subject matter expert and they say, no, I'm not the subject matter expert, then I can tell as a, as a compliance professional um, that there's a disconnect between what the manager's expectations are or the program leader's expectations are and the actual individuals doing the work. And then I know where in the documentation we need to go and focus. If I ask, for example, on the privacy side, uh, I've had a, an incredible subject matter expert when it came to, uh, to the privacy and uh, they were a senior level position, a senior level player, and they were getting dumped on by their team. And we discovered it's because their team didn't understand the privacy core concepts. They had just received this particular set of work. So we actually had to build a team. So we're working independently in the leadership of the larger set of work. And it's just one or two people on the team. But we had to go out and find the five or six people that are going to look at. Um, so risk, so privacy risk according to Canadian laws. And then we found a different team that's privacy risk according to Latin American laws. And then we had to bring all that data back together, make some assessments, do some syndication in order to provide the very best solution. And this individual that I worked with, she was incredible. She just knocked it out of the park. I really don't think she was being appreciated by her management and by the leadership people involved uh, on her side of the business, but she got it from A to Z. And then as part of the interpersonal communication skills, I made sure I let the people know. Now, I want to let you in on a little secret. Um, depending on what environment you're in and how many uh, matters requiring attention or consent orders they have, um, this type of work could be adversarial. Okay, so for example, a business unit that knows they have problems are trying to solve those problems before they get caught for having the problems. Where my methodology and, and, and many risk management professionals is that it's better to identify the problems up front, go ahead and write an issue, and then uh, formally address the, the gap. So we're doing a gap analysis, we find a gap. It's better to formally address the gap rather than is to try to get it fixed in the next version. So, so the, it becomes a little bit adversarial that the business unit itself does, they fear auditors and they'll secretly scheme to trick the auditors in order to pass an audit rather than fix the underlying problem. So really I've been in the position where I'm a, an advisor and I'm going to work with both sides. I'm, I'm mediating and facilitating the outcome, which is an enterprise si side compliance. OK, the, everybody on the team could be gone next year because of a reorg. They could get new positions or promotions. What is on paper matters the most and that we're actually doing what's on paper. And so a lot of times folks don't want to write up the documentation. They'll say it's too much work. You know, we've got 50 pages and the process gets done in 20 minutes. So you're going to have to help them with that balance. But understand that you're not a welcome guest. And there are times where even if you are super polite, even if you say, oh, I'll take care of that for you. Don't worry about it. That they're still going to think you're mean. And that's the nature of the work. Because there is a certain personality of an auditor. We can't be friends with these people. Uh, we can't buddy buddy and say, oh, don't worry about it. They'll probably never notice it in the audit because one little item that gets found could be a hundred million dollar fine or a 50 million dollar fine. And it can make the difference between a, ca a cascading reputational risk. So I've worked with organizations that have made some dumb decisions in the past and managers had brushed it under the rug and the compliance people were all friendly about it or they were overworked. You know, they weren't necessarily... Uh, on purpose, missing things, but they had big fish to fry and the little fish turned into big fish because they didn't get fried fast enough. And then the whole kitchen smelled like, like fish and you don't want that. So the point that I'm making here is that we have to drive in to the balance that gets the risks taken care of. And we have to understand there may be some collateral on the side of happiness. Now, all of that goes away when you pass the audit. It is euphoric for a business unit to spend two or three weeks to get ready for an audit and then pass the audit with flying colors or the or auditors find some minor, minor thing and they are finally free of a consent order or they're finally free of a uh, some kind of a regulatory limit. 
it is euphoric, but you don't get there with kumbaya and, and friendly friendlies and everybody happy with each other. Now, again, the interpersonal communication skills helps the ability to implement risk management strategies, your ability to work as a professional. And so that at the end of the day, even though there's some some uh, friction, you're still friends, you're still nice to each other. Uh, it is just under you have to understand it's it's a it's a hot, hot environment, a lot of fires everywhere. And of course, that's why they pay you the big bucks. But ultimately, if you write effective controls, if you can think past the work we're doing today, you will have fewer issues. You'll have fewer problems. And then it starts to run like clockwork. That privacy environment, I, I, I rave about them because they were able to systemize the entire enterprise privacy. Uh, and we can't go into a lot of details, but systemize it, package it, and make it so valuable that their controls are often picked up by other business units as shared controls. And they were able to optimize things in such a way that it really saved the organization a lot of, of money and avoided a lot of potential risk. And it was done with a team of probably six to seven people, uh, but there were three or four key people that really just kept things going. If you do this right, you're going to be one of those key people that keep things going. I'm Justin Hitt with Inside Strategic Relations. If you have questions about risk management skills that are essential to be successful as an operational risk consultant, a risk manager, a compliance officer, then ask questions in the links uh, below or visit me at www.insidestrategicrelations.com where we help you transform business relationships into profits guaranteed. And the reason we're covering the risk topics is because when you are able to, to control for uh, the risk, especially in a highly regulated environment like casinos, financial services, uh, you know, lending, there's medical health care, you're able to help people tremendously. And you're able to have a systematic approach at lowering the risk, which always improves the profit. Nothing will ruin your profit more than a trillion dollar or a billion dollar or a million dollar fine. Uh, it is sometimes uh, because the laws are spelled out clearly, um, it's sometimes very easy to mitigate in advance, which is through strong risk management skills.